for this presentation. And again, I would like to introduce our today's webinar topic, which is Treasuring the Trinity, Challenges and Opportunities. This is presented by Blake Aldridge. He's an extension associate, associate with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And this website, uh, this web portal, and this effort is made possible by Forestry and Natural Resources webinars. And that's a long-term partnership now. I've been working on this for a number of years with Bob Barton, Bill Hubbard, and myself, Eric Taylor. So we are glad that you can make this webinar today. And again, if you are interested in pursuing any educational webinars of your own, we certainly are interested in building partnerships. So without any further, let me go ahead and hand it over to Blake. Blake? All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and as Dr. Taylor said, my name is Blake Aldridge. I'm an extension associate with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in College Station. Uh, during this presentation, I'll be talking about some issues centering on the Trinity River, uh, such as water quality concerns and economic sustainability for landowners, among others. Um, and so I'll be talking about how we're addressing these issues through the Building Partnerships for Cooperative Conservation Project in the Trinity River Basin. So this project has several partners, including AgriLife Extension, Trinity Waters, the Institute of Renewable Natural Resources at Texas A&M, uh, the Texas Water Resources Institute, and the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board. So our main message through this project is to connect the fact that Good land stewardship in the rural areas will benefit the water supplies of the urban areas that rely on the Trinity River to meet their water needs. Uh, these urban areas can then invest back into those watersheds that provide them water and benefit agricultural and uh, wildlife activities at the same time. So we're going to be going through about three sections. Uh, we'll first talk about where we've been, some, uh, some of the past issues with the Trinity, uh, where we are currently, and where we're headed. So we'll first talk about the history of the river and uh, some water quality problems and policy changes that are helping to reverse those trends. Uh, but first, let's have a question. How much of the Texas population depends on the Trinity River uh, to meet meet its water needs. And Blake, I'll, I can uh, publish those results if you'd like. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Here we go just one more second to respond. Remember to respond is simply hover your mouse over and select on the appropriate letter. Okay. Okay, good. Well, most people got it right. It is about 45%. I've seen numbers from 40 to 50%, but we'll just say uh, 45. All right, so the Trinity River is a major source of water for nearly 45% of Texans. There are 8 million people that live in the basin, and most of that congregating in the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex. And surprisingly, Houston gets about 40% of its water from the Trinity River. And as you can see in this, in this map, Houston is not actually even in the basin. They actually uh, move a lot of water over from the Trinity to meet their needs. And so um, between those two metropolitan areas, uh, it's about 45% of Texans. So the Trinity stretches 512 miles from northeast Texas, close to the Oklahoma border, all the way down to Galveston Bay. It has almost 2,000 miles of tributaries that feed into it. And rural lands cover about 75% of the 18,000 square miles in the basin, while 80% of the water in the basin is used by those cities. And so this shows us the inextricable link that rural and urban lands have to one another as rural land stewardship can benefit the quantity and quality of water that will be used by Texans in the urban areas. And then these folks can then invest back into those watersheds while doing good water conservation practices themselves in the city, uh, such as you know, sensible 
uh, water or lawn watering techniques. So let's go back in time a little bit and see how this river has been used over the last 150 years or so. Uh, in the mid-1800s, there was significant barge traffic on the river, and a lot of cotton was being transported down the river. And so a lot of people had dreams of Dallas actually being a port city. And this led to some navigation projects that altered some parts of the river channel. In 1868, Job Boat One reached Dallas after a voyage of a year and four days from Galveston. But the expansion of the railroad systems quickly derailed that dream. And yes, that pun was fully intended. Um, so fast forwarding to the turn of the century, industrialization and population growth are quickly expanding in Dallas-Fort Worth. And the river was treated more like a sewer canal than, than a, a real river. And so a lot of waste from slaughterhouses and industrial, industrial plants and uh, human sewage and things like that, as well as agricultural chemicals, um, made their way into the river. And so in the 1960s, the US Public Health Service deemed the river septic and essentially unusable for about 100 miles downstream of Dallas. And so you can actually see in this photo, this photo is from March 2011 when a, a private pilot was taking photos around Dallas and he noticed this odd color coming out of Cedar Creek, which is in Dallas. And this isn't to be confused with the Cedar Creek that feeds into Cedar Creek Reservoir. This is a different creek. But it turns out this is actually pig's blood and other uh, slaughterhouse waste that was being illegally dumped by a uh, meatpacking plant there just upstream. And so that plant actually got shut down. But you know, this is it's an example of things that happened all the way up pretty commonly until the 1970s or so. So water quality was a growing concern in the 60s and 70s all over the country. And some of you may remember when a river in Ohio caught fire from all the industrial waste that was put into it. Uh, Congress acted and passed the Clean Water Act in 1972 with amendments in 1977 with the goal to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological characteristics of the nation's waters. So Clean Water Act was a major step to cleaning up our waterways by controlling pollution sources, particularly in urban areas. Um, since then, wastewater technology or wastewater treatment technology has advanced quite a bit. And so the Clean Water Act actually requires states to set water quality standards to set limits on pollutants that can enter a water body and then designate uses for creeks and lakes in the state. And so uh, some designated uses include uh, public water supply, aquatic life, contact, recreation, and fish consumption. States are required to assess the water quality in the state and report that to EPA to make sure that waterways are in compliance. So when we talk about pollution, we talk about really two main sources, point source and non-point source. And a point source would be uh, pollution discharged from a clearly defined or fixed point, such as a pipe, a ditch, or canal, um, something like that. Whereas non-point source would be something that is a lot harder to define, such as runoff from agricultural fields or um, you know a lot of parking lots and um, diffuse runoff from urban areas, uh, forestry, mining. You know the the possibilities are really limitless for this. I um, mean, you, you can actually see down here. I I borrowed this slide from the Texas Watershed Stewards, which is a um, which is actually an AgriLife Extension program as well. So they hold meetings around the state to teach stakeholders all about water quality and how they can be a part of the solution. So you can check online at that website tws.tamu.edu to uh, see when their next meetings are, or you can actually take part in one of their online courses. So 
So there's two main state agencies responsible for water quality management in Texas. The Texas Commission on Environmental Quality is really the main one, and they're responsible for setting water quality standards and uses in Texas, and they manage the point source and urban non-point source pollution programs in Texas, whereas the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board manages non-point source water quality programs that would cover the agricultural lands in Texas. So um, you can actually develop a water quality management plan with the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board uh, to help limit the pollution that's maybe coming off your, your property. Um, and the good part about one of these plans is that it protects landowners from possible regulations as uh, you know, they're, they're working with this agency to limit runoff on their properties. So uh, that's one good tool that landowners have. So before we go on, let's have a, another quick question. Uh, what does the 303D list have on it? Water rights diversions, impaired water bodies, sources of water pollution, or the best hunting spots? Give everybody just a second more to respond, but I think we got a, a pretty good response to B. Yes, B is correct. It is impaired water bodies. I wish it was the best hunting spots, um, but unfortunately it is not. So every two years, the TCEQ must report back to EPA the extent to which each water body meets the state's water quality standards. And so that report has two major parts, the Texas Integrated Report and what's known as the 303D list. So the Integrated Report describes the status of all surface water bodies in the state that were evaluated, tested, and monitored over the most recent five-year period. Uh, any water body that does not meet this, the water quality standards is placed on the 303D list um, and they're known as impaired because they're not meeting their designated use. So once on the 303D list, the clock starts ticking and the impaired water body must improve so that it's taken off the list within 13 years or the state must develop a total maximum daily load or TMDL uh, for that water body but I'll actually describe that later in the presentation. So now we're going to look at where we are currently at, with our water quality. In the, the latest report, in the 2012 report, 40 segments out of 129 evaluated were impaired. And when I, when I say segments, I just, I'm talking about uh, certain length of a stream or or uh, or lake that was evaluated um, and so 40 out of 129 were impaired and 71 were of concern because either pollutant levels are high or they're increasing every year and so uh, it's it's a concern to these water quality agencies so we actually see that 11 segments were delisted and that was due to some more rigorous sampling that found there was no issue or the segment was approved for Team DL implementation. And we also had three segments that were added and since, 20, since 2010, a total of 10 segments have been added to the 303D list. So of those 40 segments that were impaired, 25 are due to high bacteria levels and that can come from a variety of sources uh, such as wastewater effluent, wildlife, feral hogs, uh, livestock, failing septic systems, pets, um, anything that that eats and breathes and um, goes near a water body can add to that problem. 
So we're going to take a look at three specific watersheds within the Middle Trinity River Basin. Um, the Richland Chambers watershed in mostly Ellis and Navarro counties is a very important watershed as the water in this reservoir is ultimately pumped back for distribution to Fort Worth and those surrounding cities. Um, and it services about 1.6 million people. And so, as you can see, past issues, it was on the 303D list from about 1998 to 2006 for low dissolved oxygen levels. And the lake itself was impaired for uh, atrazine and high pH. And so, um, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not sure why it got taken off the list. I don't know if there was some landowner activity that uh, caused that to happen, but um, you know, it still remains a concern for our water quality agencies, and so uh, we need to remain vigilant to ensure that it doesn't get back on the 303D list, and so uh, we still need to continue practicing these uh, good practices on the land that um, will ultimately benefit our water quality. So looking at the Catfish Creek watershed in Henderson and Anderson counties, um, to give you a little perspective, Athens, the city of Athens actually sits about right there at the very top of the watershed. And so, um, so there's very, actually very little urban cover in this watershed. Uh, it goes through mostly rural land, uh, including the Gus England Wildlife Management Area uh, before entering the Trinity. So this creek has been on the list since about 2006 for low, lo low levels of dissolved oxygen, uh, which is bad for fish who need higher levels to breathe and survive. And it was placed on the list in 2010 for higher levels of bacteria. So looking at Lake Livingston, uh, a lot of the problems in Lake Livingston can be traced back to what we call legacy pollutants or uh, pollutants that are extremely hard to get rid of. They typically don't degrade in the environment. Um, and so this can be traced back to a lot of the industrial and municipal waste coming from Dallas and Fort Worth earlier in the century. And now they've made their way down the river or, and are sitting in this lake. Um, you know, and it's important to remember the Lake Livingston catches water from all the headwater areas all the way up near Oklahoma. And so the watershed for this lake is actually about 16,000 square miles, which is 90% of the entire river basin. So this really shows us how activities far upstream can impact those that live downstream. So at this point, we will uh, look over any questions, or if you have questions, make sure to put them in that text box. Yep, this is a good time to type in your questions. Um, I, I have one to get started. That the first watershed that you you showed there, um, you have some you have some. Mm -hmm. uh, examples or definitions or reasons of how or explanations of how those um, we, we we get a low level of dissolved oxygen and and uh, hydrazine and high pH. What causes that? Um, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not too sure. I've looked into it some, but I've never really been able to find. Um, any information as to what what's pinpointed? Uh, there's a lot of agriculture that goes on in this watershed, and so uh, that probably contributes some. And um, so, and, and you know, once again, I'm not exactly sure why I got taken off the list um, back in 2006, but um, you know, that was that was before my time here. So, and. Information on that is lacking, or at least uh, I haven't been able to find any good information on that. Any other questions? Uh, 
Okay. Move ahead. Okay. All right, well, let's examine these challenges that lie ahead of us, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about how uh, we're working together through these different partnerships to uh, change directions and uh, forge a new path in the Trinity Basin. But I have another question for you. So out of all these options um, or all these challenges face the Trinity River Basin except so which one of these challenges or issues does not affect the Trinity River Basin? Give everybody just a few seconds more to respond. I think you you're, you stumped them. The responses are slower to come in this time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll publish that. Okay, most. Everyone who answered said fragmentation. Uh, this is actually a trick question because all of these issues uh, face the Trinity. So actually, all those who didn't answer were correct in that. So that was a trick question. Just wanted to throw y'all for a curve. All right. So really, the the main challenge that this river basin faces is the population explosion in Texas. So, you know, we're statewide, we're expected to double our population in the next 50 years, up to about uh, over 45 million people. And a lot of this is going to occur within the, the major metropolitan areas. So, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston are all going to expand pretty significantly. Um, and with this increase in population, we're going to get a much greater demand for water. And so this is going to place greater pressure on the river with each passing year. So, but there's also several other challenges that face this. And so, with the increasing population, uh, we get greater volumes of wastewater and stormwater as uh, more areas get covered over with pavement, um, and this can result in poor water quality. It can raise water treatment costs and uh, reduce recreational opportunities as um, you know, that water may not be suitable for recreation. And so we've also had a lot of habitat loss throughout the middle part of the basin as uh, native grasslands and bottomland hardwood forests and wetlands have been converted to other uses. Uh, this in turn has led to some decline in wildlife populations, uh, particularly grassland bird species like the bobwhite quail. And so with these declining wildlife populations, we have a, a loss of recreational opportunities for landowners and even a lost income generator for landowners as uh, they may not be able to support a hunting or uh, ecotourism operation on their property. Another challenge, um, along with a lot of the rest of the state, is fragmentation, which is basically the chopping up of these large properties into smaller ones. And so in this photo, if you just look at the forest cover with all the, with the trees, then you can kind of see it's it's been chopped up quite a bit. Um, you know, and we're, I'm assuming that's all that grass in between is not native, and so, um, you know, it's it's really hard for wildlife to be sustainable on uh, fragmented lands when uh, their their habitat is not continuous, where uh, food sources may be lacking and adequate cover, and so this is a major problem that we face. 
And so looking at some data, and this is actually gathered from the Institute of Renewable Natural Resources uh, Texas Land Trends website. You can visit that at texaslandtrends.org. Um, in the Trinity River Basin, between 1997 and 2007, we gained 5,000 new properties in the 1 to 100 acre size class. And so resulting problems can include a loss of sustainable wildlife habitat and reduced agricultural productivity. So thinking about the loss of sustainable habitat, uh, one example would be the, the bobwhite quail. So their home range may be about four to 40 to 100 acres, but in order to support, fully support a healthy population, about 30,000 acres are needed. And so if multiple landowners are managing their land in different ways that don't benefit quail, then that population will not be sustained. Um, in addition, agricultural productivity is reduced, especially for cattle producers. So I'm looking at this graph even more. You can see that the smaller your land holdings are, the less flexibility you have to, to adjust when, say, drought hits. Um, that's why we're seeing a lot of folks having to sell off their cows that live on these smaller properties uh, because they just they don't have the land mass to be able to, to rotate those cattle around. So you can see for those who own less than 140 acres, only 30% report profitability from the land, while 60% of those that own over 2,000 acres report profitability. All right, I like to show this photo because uh, Texas A&M had a, had a really good football season uh, this last year, and um, I like to show how Aggie fever is sweeping the state. Um, well, I guess I wish I wish that was true, but this is actually a map of drought conditions at the the height of the 2011 drought in uh, October of 2011, and if if you don't know, that was the driest year statewide on record. And so you can see that deep maroon color is the highest index level of drought there is. And I actually read an article recently that the folks who monitor the drought and produce these maps are considering adding an, another level above the exceptional one, which is that maroon, because our droughts are getting worse and worse. So, you know, if obvious, obvious effects from drought would include uh, reduced plant growth, uh, which makes it real hard for livestock producers to feed their cattle, and overgrazing is common with that. So, you know, and the problem is when you allow everything to get eaten to the ground, you're setting yourself up for failure, or at least very slow recovery, because a lot of plants can die and lead to soil erosion or hardening, and so, uh, just a quick little tip, it's better to leave some plant material on the ground so that when it does rain, you can catch that rain and protect your soil, and those plants can recover quicker. And I would actually go ahead and uh, put August 8th on your calendar for our next webinar on uh, drought and cattle management. And um, so some other loss uh, effects from drought would be crop losses. Uh, we've seen a lot of municipal watering restrictions go into effect. Uh, if you don't know, Dallas actually, the city of Dallas implemented permanent two-day-a-week watering restrictions within their city. And then, you know, as these lake levels go lower and lower, uh, we see a loss of recreation. And so there's, I mean, there's really not much we can do about how much rain we get. It's what we do when the rain comes. But I'm glad the drought is over. Well, it's actually not. The drought never left. It actually it got quieter. Uh, 2012 was a good year, and a lot of people probably put the drought out of their mind. Uh, but as you can see, uh, condition, really bad conditions are actually worsening. Um, Right now, 75% of the state 
is in severe or higher drought conditions. And you can see um, in the middle Trinity right here in uh, Navarro and Freestone and Leon counties, uh, we have some extreme drought conditions going on. And so uh, there's still a lot of recovery that our uh, plants and habitats need to make. And uh, you know this is going to continue to hammer our ag producers and our water supplies. So at this point, uh, I'll take any more questions. Blake, it looks like we have a question coming in for two, one from Ben. Give everybody just a, a second or two to... Any questions? We'll keep those thoughts coming, and if you take some time to type in, uh, rest assured we'll get to your questions at the end of the webinar. So might be good just to move on now. Okay. All right. To, so to combat these challenges, landowners in the Trinity River Basin have been teaming up to improve the wildlife habitats and water quality of the Trinity since about 2000. Uh, their, their work led to a recognition by the state, and in 2006, the governor announced the Trinity River Initiative to improve the quality of water and life in the Trinity Basin. So uh, several non-governmental organizations and agencies have been working with landowners to build the capacity of Trinity Waters, which is a uh, landowner conservation organization based in the Trinity Basin. And then to foster a natural resources stewardship culture that um, seeks to improve the wildlife habitat and water quality of our basin. So the purpose of cooperative conservation is just like it sounds, to engage landowners to cooperate together and then to for them to own this project. So we want landowners to take the lead and work with their neighbors and be the voice for the Trinity River. So being proactive in this matter can prevent future regulation of various activities that affect landowners and this can also save taxpayer money by not having to go through the process of developing reg regulations and allows those dollars spent on conservation to be magnified and go farther than before by uh, enabling landowners to work with each other instead of exclusively relying on agencies to try and reach every landowner that's out there. Uh, we also want to connect urban resources to enact landscape level change that can benefit our, our landowners as well as the uh, quality and quantity of water that reaches the Trinity and ultimately our urban areas. So the mission of Trinity Waters is to improve the quality of life, economic sustainability, and ecological integrity of areas associated with the Trinity River Basin through a coalition of local communities, non-governmental organizations, and stewards of private and public lands. So when you notice the first two, quality of life and economic sustainability, refers to uh, the landowner's lifestyle. And so being landowners themselves, Trinity Waters recognizes that uh, you know the, the quality of life that a landowner has is going to really determine some of the other things that go on on that land. And so one of the major goals of our project is for folks to realize that good land stewardship benefits urban water supplies as most of their water comes from these rural watersheds. So we can then draw financial resources from these urban areas and benefit our rural landowners. We also want to build partnerships among landowners, conservation organizations, private companies, and agencies to work towards the same goal of enhancing Trinity River lands. So in these, these two goals really build on the first one 
as landowners do good land stewardship practices, uh, we'll see greater sustainability in ag production, an increase in wildlife populations, uh, which can provide greater recreational opportunities and economic opportunities for landowners, as you can get some of those hunters and uh, fishermen and uh, eco-tourists back on the land. And then as these practices are implemented, we can actually improve the quantity and quality of the water in the river as more rain will infiltrate into the ground and that land sponge will filter the, those pollutants and the land can actually store that water and use it later in the growing season uh, to produce more forage or um, better the wildlife habitat or it can flow through the ground and uh, provide some more flow to those creeks in, in the river which will benefit our water supply and recreation. So going through some tools that uh, we've developed and actually we're going to go to the web for this one and see if this works. And this is the Trinity Waters website which we developed as a uh, one-stop shop for landowners. So you can see up here at the top right uh, we have links to our social media outlets and websites and then we go to this landowner library you can see there's four categories water, land management, economics and education and we click on land management and we can see there's publications related to habitat conservation uh, wildlife and fisheries, livestock management, plants, and human dimensions. And so, um, all total, there's over 400 publication links on this website for, for landowners and others. Um, and you see right here, you can actually subscribe to our newsletter that we try to send out about three or four times a year just to provide some more information. All right, going back. So as I said, uh, you know, we've really, uh, more and more information is being passed through social media nowadays than, than really any other source. And so all the partners in this project have embraced this reality. And we've developed a Facebook page, a Twitter feed, and um, Scoop It online newspaper and contribute to the, the Wild Wonderings blog and the Wildlife and Fisheries Extension uh, YouTube channel to provide daily updates on news and events and uh, you know just to have daily interaction with um, with our stakeholders. All right another great tool that's been developed for this project is the Trinity River Information Management System mapping tool. And we're going to go online for this one as well. Dr. Taylor, make sh uh, I guess let me know if I'm going too yeah, fast. Yeah, might slow down a bit on this one. It takes a little bit to load. Yeah. Okay, the map I'll is down visible on my end. Do too much. Okay. So this is a it's a tool that's similar to a GIS program, uh, but it's available to for free online. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Google Earth. Um, which is another great uh, mapping program. Um, but on this website, which is ex exclusive to the Trinity River Basin, uh, you can zoom to your specific piece of land or uh, look at the river basin as a whole. Um, features on this website allow you to determine soil and vegetation types on the land, uh, measure acreage or lengths 
access elevation and uh, stream gauge data and a lot of other uh, data sources that can help in conservation planning or just land management in general. If you just want to find out how big a pasture is when you go to uh, spray herbicide or fertilizer or something, that, that's what this was developed for. So in this you can see uh, areas in blue and areas in yellow. And so what the folks at the Institute of Renewable Natural Resources did was they went in, they looked at uh, the soils, the hydrology, and the elevation data, and they combined those to determine, uh, well, first they looked at existing bottomland hardwood forest, which is a crucial wildlife habitat and um, water quality and water quantity uh, indicator. And so the areas in blue are existing bottomland hardwood, whereas the areas in yellow would have the potential for restoration back to bottomland like hardwood. Like if those are coverages, and those so are layers, they're this, not showing up uh, uh, due to the, the nature of the beast there. We're still stuck on the uh, just the outlines of the counties along the river. So we're not seeing the blues and yellows. Okay. Well, Okay, I'll go back and so you can see it on this page. So you can see all right. So you can see on here these areas in blue are existing bottomland hardwood forest, whereas some of these areas in yellow are areas that could be potentially restored back to bottomland hardwood. And so looking at this, we want to connect existing habitats together so when we're planning uh, for basin-wide conservation programs, we might try to focus on areas around here to connect these two big uh, spots of blue. All right, another question. Which of these is not an example of a watershed protection strategy in Texas? I guess your questions are getting a little tougher. <laughs> I guess so. Everybody just one second more. All right, for, for those who answered the environmental calibration model, uh, you are correct. That is not a watershed protection strategy. And really, in all fairness, the recreational use sustainability analysis is not a watershed protection strategy either. But um, I will I'll talk about that in just a couple slides. And um, but yeah, environmental calibration model is definitely not. I just came up with that. sounded it sounded smart, so I just put it down. All right, so in Texas, the main two main watershed protection strategies that are used to address water quality problems are the total maximum daily load and watershed protection plans. And so uh, the TMDLs are regulatory in nature, and they must be done after 13 years of a water body being on the 303D list. And so it, with this, they examine the maximum amount of pollutant 
that can enter a waterway and still meet water quality standards. So TMDLs only focus on the pollutant causing the problem, so other problems that may exist cannot be addressed in a TMDL plan. Um, that's in comparison to a watershed protection plan, which is voluntary and looks at all aspects of watershed health and all potential sources of pollution. So like I said, a, a key difference between these two is that TMDLs are regulatory in nature, while watershed protection plans are voluntary and not mandated by federal law. So for this reason, it takes a much more holistic approach to watershed management and uh, focuses on all potential sources of pollution within a watershed. And so lastly, uh, watershed protection plans can be developed for water bodies that are not on the 303D list, although they usually are, um, whereas TMDLs are always developed for water bodies on a 303D list. So developing WPP for your watershed can ensure that regulations don't get placed upon that watershed, uh, which is another great reason to um, get together with your neighbors and, um, and counties and cities and try to work on one of these. So one example of a watershed protection planning program in the Middle Trinity is the Cedar Creek Reservoir. Uh, pH and, um, or I guess low pH and high chlorophyll A levels led to efforts by the Tarrant Regional Water District and the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Dallas to do some modeling efforts to determine pollutant loading from different land uses in some of the sub-watersheds of the Cedar Creek overall watershed. So they looked at sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus as most water quality problems are related to these. And they also use this modeling to prioritize sub-watersheds for best management practice implementation. Uh, some examples of that would be converting cropland to pasture or uh, riparian buffers, terracing of uh, farmlands, putting in grassed waterways, and then some uh, rain gardens and things like that in the urban areas. So after several meetings with stakeholders, they determined that a goal of a 35% reduction in phosphorus levels could be achieved by conducting 13 different BMPs. And stakeholders included cities, landowners, uh, agencies, and some of the wastewater treatment plant operators. So this map shows you uh, the result of that modeling, one of the results of that modeling effort. And in this one, they looked at sediment. And you can see these areas in red uh, indicate the highest levels of erosion. And so this, this is a good indicator of poor water quality because um, nutrients like phosphorus actually stick to, to sediments. And when they move downstream, they can cause um, some problems, such as algae blooms and things like that um, in those water bodies. Not to mention, they will, you know, over time, they'll fill up the reservoir and reduce the water storage capacity of the lake, which means less water can be stored in that lake. So. They are currently working towards getting this project accepted as a watershed protection plan. Uh, and in, in order to do this, they first need to be reviewed and accepted by um, one of the state agencies, either uh, TCEQ or State Board, who will then submit it to EPA for their acceptance according to the National Non-Point Source Guidelines. All right, lastly, the recreational use attainability analyses. Uh, as I said before, they're not really a watershed protection strategy, but more of a method to get the standards right for water bodies 
designated for contact recreation, um, which in a lot of cases in Texas are primarily impaired by high bacteria levels. And uh, high bacteria is a risk to recreationists because of the chance of ingesting the water and uh, getting sick. So the problem is the standard for E. coli, which is a bacteria used to, it's an indicator organism. It indicates the presence of fecal matter in a water body. It was set at 126 colonies per 100 milliliters uh, statewide. But as many of you know, not every stream is created equal. So, you know, some streams are too shallow or don't always have water in them and or have limited public access, which limits the usability of that stream for recreation. So in 2010, uh, TCEQ adopted changes to their water quality standards that added two new levels of recreational use. You see in 2000 it was contact and non-contact recreation and in 2010 there's primary, secondary one, secondary two, and non-contact. And so primary would be things like swimming that uh, you have a strong risk of ingesting water. A secondary one would be uh, limited body contact for things like uh, fishing, rafting, boating. Um, and then secondary two is some of the same activities, but because of the physical characteristics of the water body or limited public access, uh, the chances of uh, sickness are less than secondary one. And then obviously non-contact means that there's very minimal contact, so it's, it's not a problem. Um, RUAAs are site-specific studies that assess the recreational use of a stream based on its characteristics, being whether that's water depth, persistence of flow, um, public access. So they can also do surveys and to assess the historical and existing patterns of uh, recreational use in these water bodies. So. After they do this assessment, they will uh, decide which category it should fit under uh, according to its recreational usability. And you know, if this if it gets knocked down from primary to secondary two, then the standards for that change as well. And so um, there's significant chances for a lot of streams to actually um, get kicked off the list. Uh, but landowners still need to be vigilant to manage their land in a way that will limit the opportunity for bacteria to reach the stream, whether that means managing livestock to keep enough grass on the ground to capture runoff and uh, try to limit their time in those riparian areas, or reducing feral hog numbers, or managing wildlife species correctly. So at this point, you may be asking yourself what you can do. Well, first, you can set conservation goals for your land. That makes wildlife habitat and uh, agricultural sustainability and water quality a priority. Uh, next, you can contact your local parks and wildlife or NRCS biologists or county extension agents for guidance in, in where to go next. Um, Lastly, you can get involved with your neighbors and your local officials to address some of these issues. So one, one way that landowners can actually do this is through wildlife management associations uh, where they work together under the supervision of a wildlife biologist and typically work to improve the wildlife habitat of the area for um, a specific species or just maybe wildlife in general but the, the added benefits of that would be um, making sure that the vegetation on the land is, um, is good quality for wildlife, but it would also benefit our waterways as well, as that rainfall and that runoff will infiltrate more into the ground. Um, you can also get involved with Trinity Waters and 
uh, other conservation organizations, such as the Texas Wildlife Association. And so the, the Trinity River is a common link between rural and urban Texans. What happens in one area will affect another. It's time for Trinity Basin residents to come together and restore our beautiful land and river. So funding for our project is through a Clean Water Act 319 grant from the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board. And here's contact information for myself and for Ken Clavness, the Executive Director of Trinity Waters. Um, and I'll come back to the slide, but just wanted to point out that August 8th is our next webinar, uh, Turning Your Land into a Sponge, where we'll focus on drought and cattle management. And then September 12th, we'll actually be talking about meeting the water needs for Texans and wildlife. So with that, we can uh, go over any last Very questions. Very good. Blake, I'm going to uh, take this time now to push out the link to the survey. And for those of you who are, who are looking for continuing education units, you'll need to take the survey before you can get to the quiz and the CEU form. If you're not seeking out CEUs, then you can skip that step. So I'm going to push that out into a browser window, much like you did this little demonstration there, which may pop up in front of your your uh, um, collaborate window. But and I will also put that in the text box as well. So, like while I do that, if you want to take a, a look at the chat window, there was a couple of questions there that uh, I think you can respond to. Uh, move up the screen a little bit. You'll see a couple from Jack as well. Right. Yeah, let's see. Jack, Mr. Uh, Tidwell, you're asking about um, some of the old grade stabilization structures, um, like the, let's see, old soil conservation lakes. Um, let's see, Dr. Kathy. Yes, I think NRCS, contacting your local NRCS and uh, soil and water conservation districts would be, I guess, the best place to start with that. Because they, they're typically the ones that did that work in the past, and so uh, they may have more information about it. And, um, and they have engineers and folks like that they can help out with that. Let's see, I'm looking, I don't see any more questions, but um, if anyone else has any more, I would be more than happy to answer anything you might throw at me. I gave you hard questions, so it's now, now it's your turn. Um, okay, Mr. Tidwell, you asked, are there funds to do this work? Um, I'm not actually sure about things like that. I know uh, NRCS does have some financial assistance programs in place to help um, maybe build or, I don't know, maybe repair um, some of those structures or build new ones. Um, you really ought yeah, really the best thing to do would be to contact your local NRCS and uh, soil and water conservation districts because uh, both of those have funds to do work like that. So they would be your, your best bet at this point.
All right, I've got a question from Phyllis S. Um, how do we keep grasslands up if there is a drought killing our grass? That is a great question. Um, you know, with this continued drought, the best way to protect your grass is to keep as very, very minimal cows or completely destock your cattle. Um, you know, these, our native grasses have been through droughts before, and so they're, um, you know, they've evolved to uh, be drought resistant, and um, but they aren't evolved to have a constant grazing pressure on them. Um, you know, typically the bison that moved through a lot of our prairie lands would move through and maybe not be back for um, for years at a time. And so um, at this you know at this point, if you have the capacity to rotate your grazing, then that's another great way to go. Um, you know if you if you just cannot get rid of your cattle, I would suggest uh, working with your local NRCS uh, or AgriLife Extension rangeland specialist, and they can help uh, develop a grazing management plan for your property. Because um, I know that the cattle business is hard, and uh, it's real hard right now to buy back in. Um, but the way it's looking, you know, it, it's going to be extremely hard maybe for the next year or two because it's going to take a couple of years for those grasses to recover even if we get above normal rainfall. So um, it's just the road is hard ahead um, and that's where I would encourage listening back in on August 8th to um, hear Dr. Larry Redman uh, talk about some of those tips. So Let's see, Barbara. Let's see, Spring Creek Forest. Um, yeah, Barbara, at this point, uh, most of my activities are concentrated in the middle Trinity below uh, from Dallas to Fort, or uh, Dallas to Lake Livingston. Um, I would have to actually look into that creek for you. Um, I do not know if it's under a watershed protection plan or a team DL at this point. Um, at this point, it's not in my area of responsibility, so I actually cannot answer that at this point. Okay. I think we're wrapping up here. Hopefully everybody was able to access the uh, survey at the end. I'll put my email link in there in case anybody has any problems. So, um, Dr. Taylor, Sam Cook had a question about uh, said it did not allow him to take the quiz for the CFE credits. Um, there were actually no yeah, I, it's I, offered for this webinar, so that's probably why. Oh, was or not? I thought I had CFE. I thought so I had CFE credits already registered for that. Uh, Maybe that hasn't been accepted yet. No. Well, then I. It's, okay. We will. Um, yeah. I have to go back and look. I, I don't know that we we we. Uh, I think I had to resubmit that, so we may it should have been offered or it should have been in the process of CEUs or CFEs, but maybe they weren't awarded yet. If you have any problems with that, Sam, send me an email. We'll take care of that on, on this end. We'll get it done. All right, I think we're wrapping up there. Okay, well, uh, thank you to everyone for, for attending today, and um, as Dr. Taylor said, 
this will be available for folks to watch later on, and so um, we'll get it up. It'll either be on this website, and I'll link to it from the Trinity Waters website as well. So, um, thanks to everyone for attending. Hope you have a great rest of the day. Good job. Good information. I like to I like to do another one. I like to learn more about, about all this. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot, and I I appreciate your time, and and uh, well, we'll see you at the next webinar.